know we would not be believed in you. Tune in with us at the right time. We believe that God's got a good word for you. Let's get right into it in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask that you shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to get it. Your word for us in the name of Jesus. We're open to the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Did you desire to move in our midst? And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to open with me, if you would, to the book of Haggai, chapter 1 in the Old Testament. We're continuing a teaching that we've been on for 19 weeks now called Accessing Grace by Faith. I normally don't teach such a long series, but it's been a very powerful one. And it's one in which it's helped me in my personal life, and I believe and trust that it's helping you tremendously. So as we're nearing the end of this, possibly finishing it up next week, there's a couple more things left for us to learn and to glean from. Haggai chapter 1 is the passage of Scripture that I believe the Lord's given me to give you today. In other words, at the end of the day, I'm trusting, hoping, believing. There's a message from the Lord in it for you. We begin in verse number 5 of Haggai chapter 1. Verse 5, it says this. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So while we're sitting here, while you're listening and watching this, I want you to consider your ways. The very next verse, he goes on. What do you mean, consider your ways? He says, all right, you've sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but nobody's warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. As a result of that, he says, consider your ways. I don't know if you've ever been there in life where it's felt like that you've put your money into a bag with holes. As soon as you get it in, it's gone. I'll never forget this. My grandfather, we called him Papa. He's already gone home to heaven. After Mama died, y'all excuse me, we from the country. <laughs> After Mama died, I learned in Bible school, training to be a pastor, that when a loved one passes, particularly someone that's been married for a long period of time, it's very important that you engage the remaining loved one um, because they can go through depression and loneliness. It's a huge life change. And so I would intentionally spend time with Paul Paul, call him, go by and see him if I could. And I remember I visited him one time, and he was referring to my grandmother. And he said, she can, she said, Stan Lewis, he said, Stan Lewis, that's what they call him again from the country. <laughs> he said, Stan Lewis, she can get it out the back door with a tablespoon faster than I can get it in the front door with a scoop shop. <laughs> <laughs> That left an unracial impression <laughs> upon my mind. And somebody said, yeah, that's just about right. <laughs> I could just see my mom in the back getting it out with a tablespoon faster than he could get it in the front door with a scoop shop. <laughs> well, the first service thought it was a bit more funny. Than that. <laughs> but today I want to talk to you about accessing the grace of preservation. Have you ever felt like it's getting away from you faster than you can get a hold of it? What's happening in that case, it's not being kept. It's not being preserved. The Bible teaches and talks about a grace of preservation. Obviously, in this series, we've dealt with three parts already, and we've got two remaining. We've already dealt with the fact that we're saved by grace. By grace, we have been saved. And we look beyond just being saved from hell, that we're rescued any time that we've got a situation in our life that's taken us 
that God in his foreknowledge has already provided a way of escape. He's already rescued us from any trouble that we would ever see. We can access that by believing that. We also talked about healing in the same way that by grace we have been healed and that we don't have to pray to get healed. We're already healed. We just need to see our healing manifest itself. And in the same way about addictions. The day you gave your heart to the Lord, you were delivered. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And if you begin to see that, you'll see that you are already free. That that cell door that locked you and held you in box, that chain that held you is already broken. Amen. Amen. You can get up and walk free. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Well, in the same way, we're going to look today at the word preservation. Now, all of this comes from Ephesians chapter 2. And verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 2, it is where we see the scripture that says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So we base this entire portion of our series off of this one verse saying that there's more in this word saved than just simply salvation. It includes all of these things. Now, I've quoted it to you before, but I actually want to show you so you can see it with your own eyes. That word saved comes from a Greek word. New Testament was written in Greek. And so when Paul wrote it, he said, by grace you have been sozo. The word sozo comes from a Greek word, which is from a primary word, which means safe. But this word sozo is defined to save, i.e. deliver. Or protect. And that's literally or figuratively. In the New Testament, this word in the Greek can be translated into English in a number of different ways. It can be translated heal. That's where we get healed. It can be translated preserve. That's where we get preservation. It also can be translated save or save oneself. And then also this word can be translated to do well. And then also to be or to make whole. That's where we get the five-fold definition of the word sozo. It does mean to be saved, healed, preserved, delivered, and prospered. Amen. Amen. So we're looking today about the grace of preservation. Now, all of this stems again from what the Word of God says. In 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse number 10, Peter calls the grace of God the manifold grace of God. For example, he says that each one of us has received a gift. Grace is God's gift to you of unmerited favor. There's nothing you can do to earn God's grace. It is his gift. Not only that, it's when you get something you don't deserve. So not only did you not deserve it, you didn't earn it in any way at all. For each one of us have received a gift. He said, minister this to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So Peter calls the grace of God manifold. That means it has many sides. Just like your carburetor has to have sit on a manifold in order to distribute fuel and oxygen to every cylinder, and your exhaust manifold takes all of that exhaust and distributes it through the exhaust pipe. In the same way, the grace of God is manifold, many sides. So we've looked at three sides. Let's look today at that fourth side, and that is the grace of preservation. This also comes from when Peter said in, in, in the second Peter, second book of Peter, chapter one, he says, as his divine power has given, so he's referring to something that God has already given to us. Amen. What is that? His divine power has given unto us all things. Somebody say all things. All all things. things that pertain to life and godliness, and he's given it, given it to us through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. So again, God's already done these things. He's already saved you, healed you, delivered you. He has already preserved you, which is going to be so important to see. It's already done. And all five of these things do pertain to life, and you live in a life like God would. But most importantly, we pick back up in Ephesians chapter 2. And all of this is refuted. But just in case you're here listening for the first time, this will whet your appetite to be able to go back and get it all. 
The Bible says in verse 8, of course, that by grace you are saved through faith. But in verse 10, he points out that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. What I'm essentially trying to get you to believe is that there is a really good life waiting for you to live it. Amen. And in order for you to access it, you've got to access this good life that he predestined. God never intended for you to live broke, yeah. sick, busted, or disgusted. All right. Come on. He intends for you to, Jesus said it this way, the thief comes that he might steal, kill, and destroy you and your stuff. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Well, there are certain paths that you have to take in life to get to the life that God has predestined for you to live. And you have to take those paths by faith. And we're just simply laying them out for you from the word of God. Romans chapter five, of course, in verse number two tells us that the way we access this grace is by faith in which we stand. Amen? So let's talk today about accessing the grace of preservation. Now, there's two ways, there's two things you have to do in order to access the grace of preservation. You have to do it, number one, by faith, and then number two, with the tithe. Not with the tithe. Yes, I am wearing a tithe today. It's not by faith with the tithe. By faith with the tithe. The tithe is 10% of your income. So I want to show you today, and I know it gets quiet. Amen. I tell you, this is the best message for us. Amen. The way to access this particular grace is by faith and it's with the tithe. For most of us, this is the most important message in the series to date because it's where most of us are right now. Yeah, yeah there, there are some that need to be rescued. And so understanding that if you're in a tough situation where people are against you and you need to be rescued, yeah, you know, you have been and now you can access it by believing, etc. There's some that are dealing with physical symptoms of sickness and disease and, and out of that need to be reminded that by his stripes they were healed and how to access that by faith. Don't look at the facts, but look at the truth of God's word. Same thing about deliverance. You know, if you've got bondage, addiction, so forth and so on. But for most of us, including myself, we've spent some time walking with the Lord. And in our lives right now, we are saved. We are healed. No sickness or disease. We are delivered. No addictions. But when it comes to this issue right here of being preserved, there's a question mark. We find ourselves like that group in Haggai. Where God says, consider your ways. How you, how's it working for you? How's, how's, what, how's how you're doing life working for you? Are you where you should be? He specifically asked them about their money. Do you find yourself in a situation by the time you get it in, it's gone? And if that's the case, see, what's happening is you're working hard, but you don't have anything to show for it. Well, what's going on? You're saved? Yeah. yeah. You're healed? Yeah. 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 Any bondage? No. Addiction? No. But I can't seem to really get ahead. You know, the statistics show that most Americans are one situation from a financial crisis. Amen. I'm like 70 plus percent. If something significantly were to happen, they would be up the creek without a paddle. All right. <laughs> And when you talk about what most Americans have in their savings account, you know, financial experts, they tell us that you should have in reserve uh, about one month to three months of living expenses, just in case something crazy happened, that you could go on without major life change for about a month or at least three months. But most people have less than $1,000 right now in their savings account. What's going on here? 
It's not that we're not working. It's not that we're not taking steps to get ahead. What's the problem is that we've got holes in the bag. For some of us, we take two steps forward. And because of debt, we take one step back. All right. You know, the interest payments? You know, you think it's kind of weird because you'll buy something on sale and they'll offer you it on a credit card. And you end up paying more for it than yes. you were going to anyway yeah. if, if you were to pay it in cash at the regular price. Amen. Oh, y'all will let me teach this message. <laughs> so I really want to challenge you today because this is where most of us are. Let's look again at the context of, um, of Hebrews, excuse me, Haggai chapter 1. If we pick up in verse number 2, he says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. No, it's not time for us to build the Lord's house. It's not time for us to take care of the Lord's stuff. We need to take care of all this stuff. It's not a good time for us to give to the Lord. That's essentially what this people was saying. Mm -hmm. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, verse 4, he asked the question, well, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses? And this temple lie in ruins? So the people were saying one thing, and God challenged them by asking them a question. In other words, they were saying, well, it's not a good time, or, you know, it's not time for that. And he says, well, is it time for you to take care of your stuff and God's stuff not be taken care of? And, of course, he caps that by saying, now thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He's essentially asking them, well, how is that thought working for you? You don't think it's a good time to put the Lord first before yourself. Well, how is it working for you? What, what do you have to show for that? Then he takes them right back into it. You've sown much and you bring in little. You know, you, you drink and you don't have enough. You eat, you clothe yourself. And, and, and the ones that are working, they earn wages to put it in the back. How is it working for you? And I want to challenge you in the same way. What are your thoughts? Now, very few people actually tithe that are Christians. If you do a poll of all Christians, not just those here or watching online, about 4 to 5% Barna poll says that Christians actually give 10%. Now, again, let me help you. Just because you put the, the, the dollar amount on the line on the envelope that says tithe doesn't make it a tithe. <laughs> what makes it a tithe is at the end of the year, if you earned $100,000, that at the end of the year, you've given $10,000 to the work of God. If you don't hit that $10,000 mark, then you're not a tither, even if today you write out a tithe. So, in this sense, most people don't think or make tithing or honoring God a high priority. And God is asking, well, how's that working for you? Very challenging thought. But the Bible teaches us in Proverbs 16 and verse 25, there, there, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end of that way is the way of death. I can't tell you the times that I've talked with somebody who's struggling, particularly maybe even struggling in the church financially, and they, they can't make ends meet, and you know, seeing, and they, they get tired and, and almost depressed just dealing with constant. And is there ever help or hope? And when I mention the word tithe, it's almost like I slap them in the face with a wet rag. That's just offensive. You know, I'm, I'm in a situation where I don't have enough for me, and you don't talk to me about my, and surely don't let me pull up the record. You don't talk to me about my giving to God. Literally, they are in the situation financially that they're in because of this. They're not doing it by faith and with the top. Right. They think that what they're doing is right, but the end of it isn't productive. Oh, I'm yeah, preaching yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, how is true. that that you're doing with your finances according to the Lord? How's it working for you? He talks about individuals who are working, the person who labors. And, oh, but the one who labors for himself is he, uh, for his hungry mouth drives him. People get up and go. They're working 
for their own self-gratification. In other words, they are their number one priority, and then comes God. But the Bible that we read and the Jesus that we love taught us to seek first the kingdom of God. And his, oh, it's so quiet. I know they're shouting on the internet. <laughs> seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that the Gentiles seek shall be added unto you. Think about that for a moment. What do heathens go after? They go hard after living a good life. They go hard at success and promotion. They go hard at a better house, a better car. They want better vacations. They work hard for their children to be provided for in school, for their, their retirement. They are seeking a better life. And what God says through Jesus is if you put me as your number one priority and follow me, then everything that the Gentiles are going hard after, they will be added to you. Now, if you have something added to you today, but then you lose it tomorrow, and then next Sunday you have it added to you again, and you lose it, how many of y'all know if you keep that cycle, you'll never prosper? That's why preservation happens before prosperity. And most of us are right at this level. So with that, I challenge you, listen very carefully, and do what God has challenged them to do. Really consider how you're managing life as a Christian. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 6, we continue. He says, you so much, you bring a little, you eat, you don't have enough, you drink, you're not filled with drink, you close yourselves, and none is warm, and he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag of holes. So he says, consider your ways. Let me give you a definition of preservation. To preserve, and this is just like Miriam Webster's de definition, but to preserve so that you'll know what you're believing for. It means to keep safe from injury, harm, or destruction. It means to protect. To preserve means to keep alive, intact. It means to be free from decay. To preserve means to maintain. A third definition is to keep or to save from decomposition. Are you seeing the pattern here? To keep up and reserve for personal or special you. What I'm saying to you is in that word sozo is the word preserve. To confirm it, the word safe, the root word of the Greek word sozo means safe. The word protect is also in the definition of sozo. To maintain is there. To save is there. And how about this? Reserve. God has provided this for you and I through grace, but we access it by faith. So again, in Haggai chapter 1, if you look back now, let's go a little bit further. We left off in verse number 7. He said, consider your ways. Verse 8, he says, all right, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord of hosts. What does he do? He says, consider your ways. So after he really causes it to hit home, he tells them what to do so that they can turn their situation around. And that's what you came here today for. I'm going to tell you from the word of God what to do so that you can turn your situation around. Amen. So you access the grace of preservation by faith. How does faith work? Well, first of all, you know, without it, you can't please God. So it's extremely important. Amen. Faith is a firm persuasion. If it's not firm, then it's not faith. Amen. How do you get it? You get it by hearing an anointed message and accepting it as true. But once you get it, the way it works, it works by doing something. Come on. And it works by saying something. It works by patience. It works by love. Notice that God required them to do something. Why? Because their action would require faith and faith allows God to move. That's why it's got to be by faith with you doing something with the time. In other words, he told them, go to the mountain. In other words, put God first uh -huh. yes. and see what happens. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And of course, that he might take pleasure in it and faith pleases God. Verse 9, he goes back into 
for their consideration. Have you all ever been there? It says in verse 9, you look for much, but in T and D, it came to little. I don't know about you. I mean, I, 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 I own businesses, and uh, just over the years in business, you know, man, you, expect, you put that proposal out there, and this is one of the biggest that you've ever had as a, as a, as a company. I mean, you're looking for much. And it only came to little. You ever been there where, I mean, like right now, it's, it's December. Bonus. Hey. <laughs> bonus. I mean, you're, you're looking for a big bonus, yeah. but then it only came to something little. I don't know about you. I've been there where I've looked for much. I'm looking for next year to be the best financial year of my life. I don't know about you. But I don't want to be there again and again and time, to time after time where I'm looking for much. But I, it only came to look. And then when you bring it home, the Bible says, I blew it away. <laughs> now, of course, some would think that God blew it away. Well, this is under the old covenant. And in, in truth, they were under a curse if they didn't do what God says. That's not true for us. We are blessed. And what, what God has blessed, you can't curse. We're under the New Testament. But it was true for them. But I don't know about you. I've seen people blow money. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you look at all of the, like, go through this, and man, you don't have nothing to show it. Why? No. You just blew it away. That's right. You blew it on this. You blew it on that. Came into a large sum of money of over here and over there. And then you look up and it was blown away. And then God asked the question. He says, Why? You know, I, I don't believe in doing the same thing and getting the same result. You know, some people say that's insanity. I believe in doing things by faith, regardless of what it looks like, amen, and expecting a different result. But it's insanity if, if, you, if you're doing the same thing and it's not working. You need to stop and say, well, why isn't this working? He said, why, says the Lord of hope. He says, I'll tell you why, because my house that is in ruins while everyone runs to his own house. The reason why you looked for much and it came to little or you blew it is because you put yourself as a number one priority and not God and it doesn't work like that. Yeah. If you do that, you'll be open to having holes, the devourer, the destroyer, the devil, come in and take what you have. So again, you take two steps forward and two steps back because it's not preserved. What preserves it? If you preserve it by faith, by believing it's preserved, and you do it with the tithe. Amen? Amen. Oh, it's quiet still. <laughs> Let me keep going. <laughs> Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. In other words, if the heaven gave rain, and if the earth was productive, it would be easy for you. But because you've made yourself a priority and not God, things are harder for you than they need to be. Am I preaching to anybody here? Right, so let's dig into this. Uh, so he said, For I call for the drought on the land, on the mountains, and the grain, on the new oil, and the wine, and whatever the ground brings forth, on the men and the livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Okay. So how do you do it? How do you access the grace of preservation? Number one is what? By faith. And then number two is with the time. So let me deal with number one, and then we'll deal with number two. Number one, you've got to do it by faith. Yes. Now, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to what? Keep that which I have what? committed unto him until that day. For most of us, like I said, we're past that part of the field of salvation. We're past that part of the field of healing. We're even past that part of the field of deliverance. You know, I said that grace, the grace life is like a football field. For most of us, we get the ball that used to be on the 20-yard line, right? Yeah. Now it's the 25. But that, that's usually a gimmick. Some people actually struggle with salvation. They got like one foot, they're just one foot out of hell. They get the ball on the one-yard line, and they struggle month after month just to see that they're saved. They wonder and question if they were to die today, where they would spend eternity. But for most of us, we're past that. We know that if we were to die, come on, y'all. If we know that if we were to die, 
we're saved. Amen. Not only that, we're, we're, we're at the 40 yard line. Because we're still on, on their side, but we, we're saved and we're healed. Some people struggle with healing, but praise God, but most of us are saved and healed. And again, there's a large portion of the body that's on the 40 yard line on our on the, in our territory. Amen. We got the ball on the other 40, right? Yeah. And so we just got 40 more yards before we get this goal. But this is where the struggle, the struggle starts the most. Save, heal, and deliver. But we're still losing ground. We're three and out. Come on. <laughs> just kind of see. Some of us just push back in some addiction, some other things to believe. But most of us struggle right here. Yes. I can tell you why. You've got to believe to be preserved. Right. Paul had this. He said, I know him whom I have believed. Do you have that kind of confidence that when you buy a new set of tires, that, that you're not going to run over something and blow that tire and have to buy another tire? Come on, think about it. That's how, it, that's how the holes happen. We buy an appliance and it breaks. We get a car and it needs this. And we, we, we get a house and now this comes up. Come on, constantly things are happening. We're taking steps forward, but then things happen that prevent us. I challenge you, you've got to have the same assurance that Paul had. He says, I know him whom I have believed. Yeah. That reminds me, yeah. you know, faith works by love. Love, you can know that God loves you, but you yeah. also have to believe that he loves you. Yeah. He said, I got them both. I know that God is able to keep this, and I believe that he is able to keep this. He even said, I'm persuaded. If it's not firm, then it's not faith. It's a persuasion. He said, I am persuaded that God is able to keep that which all which I have committed unto him. What if you got something in your life that you haven't committed unto him? And how do you commit things to the Lord? I can tell you concerning financial things, that car that you got, is it committed to the Lord? How do you know if it's committed? Well, if you took your income and tithes and then took out of the 90% that remains and bought the car, you could say that car was bought with committed money. Therefore, I know whom I have believed. I've honored the Lord. I put him first and now I got this car. Now, God, I am persuaded that you will keep that that is committed unto me. Uh, let's look at another scripture. Is God able to preserve us from decay and destruction? The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 29, the children of Israel, they came out of bondage into the promised land. How many of y'all remember that? But in between bondage and the promised land, there was the wilderness. They learned some things in the wilderness before they stepped over into prosperity so they would know how to handle it when they got there. So in the wilderness, God kept them and he preserved them. The Bible teaches us that their clothes did not wear out for 40 years. They had shoes that they had been wearing for 40 years during that time. What did he do during the, the wilderness period? He preserved them. They weren't in a place of prosperity, but they, they weren't in a place of loss. And for most of us, if we could get rid of the holes in our lives, we would prosper. But again, so often, because we're putting this into a bag with holes, we don't really get ahead. Deuteronomy chapter, is this, is this good? Yeah. In Deuteronomy 29 and verse 5, he said, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have, what, have not worn out on you. And your sandals have not worn out on your feet. He said, I did that. I kept things from breaking in your life. That alone, preservation alone is an amazing gift from God. Yes. If he would just keep stuff and preserve it. Amen? Amen. It ought to be you have to get rid of stuff, not that it breaks. It's just I'm tired of looking at it. You know, when this suit go more, I've had this for 14 years. I've had these shoes, man. 
bad for all this time. Let me get these things. They just don't wear out. Why? Because God is keeping your stuff. Think about it. You can buy appliances and they just never break. Come on. You can, you, come on. You can buy you know, things around the house and things for your church and they just don't wear out. What's that? That's the grace of God. One last scripture on this part that you have to do it by faith. So you have to believe that God is able to keep stuff in your life. Yeah. You know, you, you get a new phone and you break it, but there goes enough. You know, even if you got insurance, it's going to cost you the deductible. That makes me mad, by the way. $300. $300. That's insurance. You tell me about no deductible for a phone? I gave you, you know, hundreds of dollars for this insurance. I'm buying the phone. Well, yeah, you know, they ain't dumb. They ain't not count. They get you on the front end with the insurance payment, right? And then on the back end with the deductible. Hey, they're covered. Come on, y'all know we need to be as smart as the world. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 2. The Bible says this. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of trouble. And to reserve. Remember, reserve was one of those words. He knows how to reserve. Uh, reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Say this out loud. The Lord knows how, the Lord knows how to, deliver to deliver and to reserve. And to reserve. He knows how to help you take care of your stuff. Amen. 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 So let's deal with this other part, which is the big part. You do it by faith, but you also do it with the time. Anytime you give to the Lord, it is an act of faith. You are acting in faith. Because for most of us, we need all the money that we have right. for stuff in our life. Right, right. When you take and give a part of that to the Lord, mm -hmm. you're doing that by faith. You're saying, God, I need this, but I honor you, so I'm giving yeah. it to you, right? right. right? And I'm going to believe that what I need is going to be there, yeah. okay? Right. So when you do it, it is an act of faith. But let's talk about it and of it itself, mm -hmm. because a lot of people misunderstand the time. In Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8, the Bible says, will a man rob God? He says, yeah, you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offering? I believe it's true today. If you were talking to this group, he said, will you all rob me? And in your mind, you're thinking, I'm not robbing God. Like the person that I talked to, believer, you know, in a situation living from paycheck to paycheck. But then when I bring up the tithe, it's like, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't rob God. I mean, God knows. I mean, God understands. I ought to be getting from God to help that I need. He says, you robbed me when you didn't give me 10% right. and above 10%. Yeah. He said, well, how is that robbery, robbery to God? Consider your ways. And what are you robbing him from? Well, let's keep reading. He says, as a result, you are cursed with a curse, even this whole nation, because you have robbed me. Now, I do not believe that a Christian can be under the curse. Okay. The Bible says that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Whether you tithe or don't tithe, I don't believe that you're under a curse because you are blessed and what God has blessed, you can't curse. Amen. But for them, they were commanded to tithe. And they were told that if you do this, you'll be blessed. And if you don't do this, you will be cursed. But we don't have that. And I'll show you in a moment. Verse 8, though, he tells them, all right, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that and pour you out more than enough blessing that you have room enough to receive. So this is them being commanded to bring the tithe into the church. Now, did you know, nowhere in the New Testament is the Christian commanded to tithe. If you were to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you will not find one verse like Malachi chapter 3 that says, bring all the time into the storehouse and this and this will happen. Or that you're under a curse because you've robbed God. You'd also find, if you read from Matthew to Revelation, nowhere in the New Testament are you commanded to love God in the same way that they were commanded under the Old Testament. Matter of fact, the one new commandment that Jesus did give us was to love one another even as he loved us. But we're not commanded like they were to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, is it good to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength? Yeah. Is there a benefit from that? Yeah. But the reality in 1 John, he said, you 
love him because he first loved you. You ain't got to command the believer to love God. They already love God. I don't have to tell my two-year-old child or my five-month-old child to love me. They love me naturally. And the five-month-old, he is so cute. Oh, man. He's starting to notice me. Now, for the first three months, he was hearing his mom. He see me just like he see you, like we would see you. Didn't matter. But, man. If I walk in the room now, his eyes light up, he'll drop his pacifier, and he smiles with his whole face. Oh, man, that touches my heart so big. I love those boys. But I don't have to command them. Even my wife, what, what do I look like commanding my wife to love me? Even she does or she don't, right? Yeah, she does. Right? But, but thank God that we didn't have to be commanded to love. And in the same way, do you have to be commanded to honor God by giving him 10%? I don't. And that's really what this comes down to. So let me repeat this. Nowhere in the New Testament are we as believers commanded to tithe. Write this down. You don't got to tithe. You get to tithe. And that's the truth. And that's what most people don't understand. You don't got to. You have access to do something that others have done that's to your benefit like you can't even imagine. Let me give you some scripture. Now, tithing is in the New Testament. Don't get me wrong. Jesus said you ought to tithe. Again, if you love him, then you ought to do what he tells you to do. Well, in Luke chapter 11, verse 42, he said, but what are you Pharisees? For you tithe on the mint and on the rue and on all manner of herbs. Uh, and again, he's talking about uh, the kind you cook with. And <laughs> and you pass by justice and the love of God. These tithing you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In this verse, Jesus says you ought to tithe even on the tiniest part of your income. You know, I used to get to the place where, oh, you don't have to tithe on the cents. You know, just kind of round it to a nearest dollar, so forth and so on. And also, to my fault, I was rounding the tithe that we were giving as a church. And on June 11th, I'll never forget, it was on a Monday, the Lord challenged me concerning the tithe. He challenged me to be careful to tithe and to watch over it and to give it properly. Don't wait. And so from then till now, Every week, we as a church tithe to the penny. Amen. You know, we've gotten to the place because of electronic giving. You know, money shows up in the church account just about Monday through Friday, right. which is a blessing because you know it's not just on Sunday we give in the offering and the deposit is made on Monday. I mean, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and as a result, I was assuming, well, we normally receive this much in a month, and I was normally giving, but it wasn't accurate. Right. Right. And I believe. On June 11th, we as a church turned a corner. Amen. We had the best summer that we've ever had. We've had the most growth that we've ever had. If you wonder why things are happening in FA family, it's because we have taken honor in God to a new level. If $1,526.22 come, then on whatever day I set to do the finances, $152.62. Don't ask me to do that again. <laughs> I, I, I text the giving. Thank God for electronic giving. I used to have to type up a check to another church or ministry and then put it in the mail and so and then watch the account and all of that. Now I can do it instantly and sow that time to other churches and ministry. And I believe that now we're going to be preserved and protected at a whole nother level. Amen. And the same is so in your lives. So you don't got to tithe, you get to tithe. Jesus said you ought to, which means you should, but you don't have to. Let me give you one more. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 8 says here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. This is in Hebrews, this is in the New Testament. So although nowhere can you find that, that, that you're commanded to tithe, it's still in the New Testament. Matter of fact, he says, Mortal men receive the tithe, like in a moment, you know, we'll have the offering. Well, I'm a man that will die should the Lord tarry his coming. But when you give the tithe, and I don't receive it personally, it goes into the organization. Amen? 
But when a man receives it, you're not giving it to a man. It says there he receives your tithe. Yes. The one who is witness that he lives, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? So it is in the New Testament, but it's not a direct command. It's not a direct command. One other scripture. In John chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says that for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I wish I had time to really unpack this particular verse, but I'll just say this in short. The law refers to the command of tithing. When you look at this verse in light of tithing, tithing was given by Moses. If you didn't know it, actually, we read it in Malachi, but in Leviticus, God said the tithe belongs to the Lord. It is only if you use it, you're in trouble, and if you use it, you need to pay it back with 20% interest. That was Moses' command. He said that came with Moses, but something different came with Jesus. Under the Old Testament, you have the tithe. Under the New Testament, you get to if you want to. And if you do, one of these specific benefits is that your stuff will be protected. If you wonder why, you can put money in the pockets with holes. That as fast as you can get it, the fastest it's gone, is because of the tithe. Ever one. Amen. 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 Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. The Bible teaches us that Abraham tithed before the law. See, Abraham was before Moses. The law came by Moses. But let me show you an example of an individual who just decided, not because of a command, he just decided out of his love for God, because of what God had brought him out of, he decided from his heart, you know what? From this day forward, God, I'm going to give you 10%. He just picked that number. Nobody, Adam didn't have the command. Nobody had the command. Abraham decided, God, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything that I get. Amen. The Bible says that he came to a king and he said, blessed be the God most high. <clears throat> Melchizedek, the priest. He said, who has delivered his enemy to your hands? And he gave Melchizedek 10% of everything that he just received. Verse 22 of the same chapter, Abraham said to the king of Solomon, I have raised my hand to the Lord God, yes. the most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. What, he, what is he saying? At some point in my life, I raised my hand to God and I said, God, you have been with me in trouble. My family was headed in a bad direction, but you brought me out into a good place and you've given me life, a new life. From this day forward, I raise my hand to you that whatever I get, I'm going to honor you with it. I'm going to give you a part of it just as my love. He made that commitment. And that's what I challenge you to do. If you want to plug up the holes, you do it one by faith, and then you do it, number two, with the time. As I said, there's two specific benefits. The first benefit of tithing is that God will open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out more than enough blessing that you have room enough to receive. Now you have already. He was talking to them in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Bible says you are already blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But where, are you, where do you and I live? We live in earthly places. Where do you need those blessings in earthly places? So when you tithe, it opens the windows of heaven over your blessing and releases it. It causes it to manifest in your earthly places. That's what it does for us in the New Testament. And the second thing that it does is verse number 11. The second thing God promises that he'll do. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer. I'm looking at something being preserved. It's preserved from being devoured. And when you tithe, you're essentially, you're saying, Devil, this money is off limits to you. Amen. When you tithe, when you take a 10% of it, if the, the Romans says if, if, the, if, the, if part is holy, then the whole lump is holy. Yes. If you dedicate a part of your income to the Lord, you protect the rest of your income. Yes. All right. yes, sir. This is almost too powerful to teach. Yes. Because if you begin to do this, you'll see your stuff preserved. And if you start putting stuff in a bag and nothing is coming out, that bag is going to run over. Yes. Come on, eventually it's going to be good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. Why? You don't have holes in your bag. I know I'm over time. Let me close with this. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verse number 30, therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, based on how you've been living, I'm changing that. Far be it from me. From now on, those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, putting themselves first, shall be likely to sting. I still esteem, but likely. <laughs> Let me break it down. In the first part of Samuel, the children of Israel weren't living right. The priests weren't living right. Two sons, Eli, they're sleeping around with people. They've taken stuff out of the offering and misusing it. They're not doing right. And God looked at it and he says, their ways aren't right. I had said that they would walk before me forever. I need to change that. In other words, it's not going to be automatic, irrespective of their actions. From now forward, those that honor me, I will honor. Amen. This is a tithing verse. Because truly, when you take a tenth, a tenth, your income, oh, I forgot to tell you all an important story. I'll tell it real quick. See, when you come into large sums of money and you don't tithe, you will have, you'll have nothing to show for it after a period of time. Right. A friend of mine, Yogi, he's gone home to be with the Lord. God rest, bless his soul. He knew the Lord, but he struggled to be saved and healed and delivered. But even in this area of prosperity, I remember he told me he applied for Social Security disability. And he got like a massive sum, like twenty or $24,000. I said, listen, Yogi, you're not a member of my church, but I'm going to tell you, if you want to protect this money, Give a tenth to the Lord. Time went on. His spending got big. Oh, Stanley, I'll pay for that. Oh, we're doing this. They bought a new car. They did that. And I don't know if they've ever tired. But I can tell you, within a year's time, he called me. Hey, Stanley, can I borrow $150? Oh, yeah. uh -huh. He was back in the same struggling place that he was. He wasn't preserved. Be like I've seen people come into large sums and blow it, but I've also seen people, one lady at another church I was pastoring, she got an inheritance check for a million dollars from an uncle that she wasn't even close to. Amen. I hope I got some uncles like that. <laughs> I remember, I saw this huge spike on the graph for the offerings. She gave a hundred thousand dollars in offering. And to this day, she's blessed. Amen. She ain't calling me asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did y'all get anything out of this today? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Last thing to do is to do about faith at the time. You there? Yeah, we're done. Bye.